talked about children who are angry with their fathers. We talked about briefly and summary summarized just seven different fathers. But we want to zero in on the children, the children who are angry with their fathers. Because the Lord is concerned about the children. When I say children, and I'm not necessarily talking about the little five, six, or seven, eight years old. You could be 50, 60, or 70, or 80 years old. But a product, y'all follow what I'm saying? Of one of those categories where your father, you failed you. And the healing balm, even Christ, is, has paid a price that we all can be free. The price is paid. We can't add anything to it, but we can believe, right? And as we believe and apply the faith, then we become recipients of God's grace. Book of Ephesians chapter 6 reads thus. I'll give you time to find it again, if you will, and then stand. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Let's read responsibly. Verse 2, if you will. That it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In Colossians 3, again, we'll read this passage. Paul, in dealing with the family, he dealt with wives, dealt with husbands, and then the last two children, well, not the last two, but children and fathers. Verse 20 says, children, obey your parents in, the, in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Together, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. Father, add to this word in these next few moments, say what you desire to be said. Make us sensitive to your spirit. We'll honor you, for it belongs to you all the glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Take control now. Have your way. Amen. God bless you. So we mentioned in Malachi where the Lord said he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers before that uh, day of the Lord. He said, lest I smite the earth with a curse. We talked about the different types of fathers. We talked the first week about the father, fathers that abuse their children. Fathers in the second week, the fathers that abuse the children's mothers. Today we'll talk briefly about fathers that abandon their children. Fathers that abandon their children. And after we speak briefly about that, we're going to talk about the children that are angry, sons and the daughters. I shared with you an incident where I was at a certain service and, and God spoke to me and said there was a man here longing for his father and I looked for a, maybe a young man, but it, to my amazement. He was well in his years. And um, all of these years, time alone was not enough to bury or erase the pain 
and the sorrows that he felt because his dad was not there. And so he stood up. I asked him if they would come. I didn't know who it was. And he stood up and he came to the altar. And he must have been late 70s. But you would have thought that something just happened. The way God, the way he sobbed. Some things time may heal. Some wounds time may heal. But I can assure you some things time will not take care of them. And But God, hallelujah, he's the answer to the problems. So we we'll talk about the angry children and daughters, sons and daughters. And then briefly, the effects of anger over a period of time can be detrimental to our health. So we want to understand and open wide our hearts for the Lord's healing love to flow. The solution is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that by the, by the word brought the world into existence. And um, Adam came and sinned and brought the curse upon humanity. Jesus Christ came to remove the curse. And he removed that curse. And now, thank you Jesus, we all can be free because of Jesus Christ. Briefly, today's focus is men that abandoned, or fathers that abandoned their children. To abandon means to desert or neglect. To abandon means to cease to support or look after someone. To desert, it suggests people that are abandoned may be helpless without protection. They may be weakened but not destroyed by one's absence. To desert, to forsake, to abandon. God promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. Isn't that good news? You can always know that God is there for us. So, um, <clears throat> someone said in a study that was a part of their ministry seeking to restore fathers, and uh, they did some heavy, extensive research, and they found out that fathers that abandoned their children, not all the time is it the father's fault. As a matter of fact, they said in mostly, a lot of times the fathers have had that to happen to them. They've been abandoned by their fathers. And that pattern begins to repeat itself. And so when they get a woman pregnant, they look, they hope to, they have a chance and in their minds to try and make it right. But they are deficient in areas of their lives. And it says that a lot of times the child's mother or the woman um, does not see in that person what is ideal as far as what they would like to see, the kind of financial support. And, and so they discourage that person and moves on to another. And so they said that the biggest problem is not the relationship of the fathers with their children as much as it is the fathers with the children's mother. That's where the real weakness is. And uh, some fathers, uh, they are looking for the ideal or the soulmate. And if they don't feel like that person is normally when they get into these sins they haven't made any serious commitments and because they haven't made any serious commitments when the man find out that there's a child on the way then uh, you know it can change the thing and so on both part the man and the woman 
uh, but they say this is where the biggest weakness is. And so if the woman discourages the child, discourages the father from being in the child's life, not all situations are like that, I'm saying, but they're saying the majority of the times there was not really much commitment made when they got into these things. And so the breakdown was there. And naturally, of course, the child gets the burn of it. That's what studies say. There's exception to every rule. And we didn't say everything is like that, but I was just giving a, just a brief briefie about what they found mostly. So key weaknesses in the, is in the parents' bond with each other. Fathers may be looking for the perfect soulmate, and they're going to move on now because that's not the idea. Mother may be looking for the man uh, who will really provide this, uh, have a, uh, be the person that will bring about a stability and financial uh, security. And that person may well not be the person as far as they're concerned. So, But anyway, um, but the father that abandoned, there can be a number of reasons, but these are some of the reasons why the father that abandoned the children um, it's in our society, you well know, and not not only in America, but in all of the nations of the world, there's, it's, it's heavy, and uh, it's a lot. It's really bad, and there, there there needs to be a cry to instruct and reach out to the fathers uh, to understand their responsibility. And um, many of them are not saved, but normally when a father, a person gets saved, it starts the renewal process where they can begin to see and take responsibility for uh, their children and their mistakes and things of this nature. So we're glad that Jesus Christ gives us second chances. He's a good God. And um, <clears throat> so briefly, as I said, I'm not here to really talk a lot about the fathers. We want to zero in on the children. I believe the Holy Spirit wanted to zero in not only on the fathers but on the children because he said children who are angry. So the subject is children. Somebody say children. And the verb is angry. And, uh, all right. So um, abandoned child may, may experience a, a lack of physical development in the manner in which God intended. They may experience mood swings. They may experience anger and may not really know. Christians are fortunate to know, but may not know where this, the root of this anger is coming from. They may just know that somehow they, you know, they, they find it hard to speak kind to people or maybe even to the uh, uh, other children or to people because the anger at the root affects a person's speech. We saw that in the Bible when we looked at Joseph's brethren that were angry at him. They couldn't speak in a peaceful manner. So one of the characteristics of a person that's angry is their speech will betray them. Their speech makes them know. And you, you've heard people say, and you may have seen that I'm sure many times, said that person seems like they're angry, you know. And, but you see the, how they speak. So God is concerned about our speech, right? So when he heals us, and it, it affects our speech in a positive way. But an angry ch child, uh, and they, and when I say child, I should say uh, uh, those, the children of the fathers, because you hear the word children, and it's easy to just say, well, the younger ones. But we're talking people now, uh, young and old. And uh, because that's the target, what God is saying, uh, people that are angry with their fathers, God will take the root and get the root, and it'll mean everything. Uh, they experience mood swings, anger. There are abandonment fears. It impairs their ability to trust. Somehow or another, they don't, they don't mean to be that way, but they're just afraid to fully, fully trust it's their ability to trust is impaired. 
So when a person is not able to fully trust, they have fears there. So they're going to do whatever it needs to be done to protect their interests, right? So um, whether it's good or bad sometimes, but abandonment fears. God wants us to trust him in one another, right? They, it may hinder development. As I said, normally there is a natural developmental process and those that deal with childhood, childhood development, you know that better than I, but there is a natural development process that takes place so that at every stage there is a supply that comes from God we are to learn certain things. But when that process is interfered with, you've heard people say that they act just like a child. They have temper, temper tandem and you, what's wrong with them? Well, somewhere their developmental process has been impaired. And uh, so God wants to heal so that the person's uh, normally, whether it's emotional, sometimes it's emotional development, sometimes it's uh, the ability to grasp things and put them in the right perspective. Sometimes it's that. It could be a number of things that's interfered with that development of process. And so when God heals, it turns the light on in the soul and truth comes in. Light comes in. Isn't that right? And when that light comes in, the Bible says the entrance of thy word give it light. And so that light comes in and it's truth. And Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So there's a freedom that comes when light comes in, when truth sets in, right? It's so beautiful, you know. There's been a many times in my life that when God shed it, the light, truth, I was like, wow, you know. But before truth came, there were anxieties, there were concern, there was twisted perceptions. It's just so many things happen. But once the truth comes in, it brings about a peace, a reassurance, and it brings about a freedom. I remember one time Satan was playing crazy games with me because he knew that there were some areas where that, were, that was distorted. I was accusing God of things that he shouldn't have been accused of. And so one day the Lord began to make clear to me, he said, son, that, that, I wouldn't have done that. That's not me. And I knew that voice. And when I heard that voice, I said, wow, so... All of this time, he's been really trying to trick me. And, 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 but once that came, it brought such a peace. Because light came in. And see, God is always about to do us good, right? He, he doesn't want to harm us. He doesn't want to, you know, put a big stick over our head and say, you're going to do this or else. God is love. He loves us so much. And, and he sees the struggle that we have here in this flesh, right? So he wants to do us good. He, he's, he is so how many times have I gone before the Lord with a twisted perception of God only to understand he gave a word or two to me while I was in prayer. And I thought, wow, I didn't know that. Because it wouldn't have brought about the anxieties had I known that. God is good, somebody. He loves us so much. He loves us. And so the things that happen to us when uh, uh, there's been abandonment by our fathers it hinders development and then there's relationship problems if I have distrust issues if I have um, other image problems images in my mind as a result of what I saw it's going to affect my marriage because those images got to be changed right and once that word comes to help change these images, I start to think different. I start to act different. Right? And I start to do differently. We're talking growth, somebody. Isn't that right? Remember what Paul said in, 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 in uh, Hebrews 5? He said, for whom in the time you ought to have been teachers, he said you have need that someone teach you again, which be the first principles. Yeah. And he says, still on milk. And he said, because you can't 
digest strong meat because strong meat, now I'm not saying that about us, but I'm just pointing, making clear the point that I'm making. But strong meats belong to those who are of a mature age, right? And who have their senses, right? Exercise, right? To discern what? Good and evil. Do you see the sense of how it's important is to develop and grow in this? So we, we, we don't call good evil and we don't call evil good, right? Oh, my God, it's so awesome, you know? And I, I shared with you about one time I was seeking the Lord and I, I had this perception of a person. And the Lord said, uh, uh, he said, insight, son. Ask me for insight. So I began to pray and ask God for insight. And as I began to pray and ask God for insight, he shared what I didn't understand. I didn't know. I was like, wow. I didn't know that. So again, it brought a different perception. I was like, wow. Now, when that happens, I can treat a person different, right? Because now those thoughts that are coming from the wrong source are not there. God let light come in. And because that light came in, it exposed the lies of Satan. See, Satan will take advantage of our ignorance. He's always looking. The Bible says he's going about as a roaring lion. So he does that. He does what he does good. So relationship problem, problems in marriage, distorted images it can create. God, mad at God. Have you ever, anybody ever been mad with God? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Anybody ever been mad with God? You know why? Distorted images. And the world is like that because they feel like, if God is so good, why in the world does he allow all this starvation? Right? Who gets the blame? God gets the blame, right? You and I know well that God is love. And there was a nation that God was about to destroy, and it broke his heart. He said, their sins came before me, and I knew that judgment was coming if I didn't find somebody that would intercede. And he said, so I sought for a man. I sought for a man that was stand in the gap, in the hedges, so that I wouldn't have to, right? Well, why would you have to, God? Because of sin. So even in that, God sought for a person to just pray and intercede. Remember Abraham, when God was about to uh, deal with Sodom and Gomorrah? The sins had gone up and judgment was coming. So Abraham... Knew that, and Lot was down there. He said, God, you, 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 no, 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 you're a righteous judge. God, if you found 50 righteous people in there, would you, would you, you, you wouldn't destroy that whole place if there was 50 righteous? God said, if I find 50, I won't destroy that city. Now, Abraham knew there weren't 50 righteous people in there, so he had a problem. So he started interceding. Well, man, Lord, perhaps if there were 45, 40? He said, I wouldn't do it for 40. Well, what about if you find 30? He said, I wouldn't do it if I find 30 righteous. Lord, don't, don't be upset with me. I, 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 I ask you, if you found 20, would you destroy that city? He said, I wouldn't do it for 20. He said, oh, Lord, I, I know I know, I done overstepped my bounds. I done, I done outran my grace. I done ask you for things that I, but, Lord, can I just one more time ask you, if you, if you found 10, and God said, I wouldn't destroy that city if I found 10 righteous. Intercessor. That's what he's looking for, isn't that right? He's 
looking for somebody that will approach his throne. Pull on God. Lord, save that person. God, heal that person. Because if 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 if, if somehow or another God doesn't get through and help them, then guess what's going to happen? So God, that's where you and I come in as children of God. This is part of our big purpose, right? Approach the throne of God. He's given us access to the throne so, us, so we can pray. Isn't that right? Okay, all right. So that's a part of our big purpose that we intercede for others. Priestly anointing. Anybody want the priestly anointing? Somebody thought the priestly anointing was something else. Has to do with prayer. <laughs> Interceding. Amen. All right. So, but anyway, uh, that, that's, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I was pointing out that there are images, distorted images of God. We can see God in the wrong way. God is good. He's a great savior, and the more we learn about him, the more the grace we can experience. That's what Paul said. Some of the effects of anger. This is why one of the reason, reasons why we must allow God. And I've been searching my heart on a regular basis. God, if there's anger there, I want you to let me see it. What I'm not going to do is act like, oh, I'm above that. Because we don't know the heart. Isn't that right? The Bible says the heart is, there you go, wow, man. Who can know it, right? But the goodness of God is this. If God began to say, this is what, don't, this is funny. When God says, okay, I want to hear you, this, don't do like this. Who, me? Don't act like, that can't happen to me. You gotta be serious. I'm... That, that happened to me years ago. I remember God was talking to me. I said, me? God, you serious? We don't know our heart. So the, the wisdom is to be open, right? Be open for God. When you sense the Holy Spirit give you that little gentle nudge, you say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, have your way. Because the only one to do is good. He's a great God. So symptoms, symptoms. Sometimes migraines. Hypertension. Digestive problems. Sleeplessness. Increased anxieties. Skin problems can even get more serious and uh, so God in his love he wants to help us I, I just I just I am so grateful to God for his love for us let, let me take you through a few of the verses here briefly and, and, and then I'm done why we need to examine and allow God to minister healing from anger children who are angry. Anger in itself is not bad. Anger is simply one of those emotions that God has given unto us, right? So anger in itself is not bad. All anger is not bad. It's just, we're not talking about the anger that would happen when a person is uh, angry with sin and what Satan is doing uh, against others. We're not talking about that kind of constructive anger. Anger that can yield the fruits of righteousness. The Bible has hundreds of things to say about anger and most of them has to do with God's anger. So we know that God is, he doesn't have a chip on his shoulder. We, we know he's not prejudiced and all that stuff. So it's constructive anger. Anger uh, uh, that can uh, keep a whole world from being polluted. You know, it's, 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 so God is good. But we're talking now about the, the, the anger that's de can be destructive in the long term. That's what we're talking about. So I don't want the people to say, oh, God, I can't anger. Uh, the, the, the preacher there talking about you. He said, anger is saying, no. All anger is not bad. It's just that in our human nature, when we get angry, uh, 
if it's constructive, it's good, but all anger is not constructive, right? And sometimes if it's not constructive, it can do damage to others. So let's look briefly into the word of God, and I'm going to let you go. In Genesis, it talks about Cain. And Cain, God gave an assessment of his situation and his offering. And God didn't accept Cain's offering, and Cain was angry. He accepted Abel's offering. So why Cain was mad with Abel, that doesn't seem to make sense. But he was angry with Abel. But it started from the fact that God accepted Abel's offering and not Cain's. That's how it started, right? And he got so angry and he, that anger stayed until the day came. And the opportunity came and he killed his brother. God asked him, what happened? Where's Abel? I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. And then we find Esau was angry with Jacob, right? So the Bible has, like I said, hundreds of things to talk about anger and wrath and this kind of thing. But Esau was angry with Jacob, his brother. angry, no doubt, because the Bible goes all the way back to the fact that Esau, I mean, Jacob was a supplanter. He connived him and deceived him from the beginning. And uh, so no doubt, Esau had it out for him, but then it culminated when he took his blessing of the firstborn. Anger can be cruel. Then there's the Bible talks about in Genesis, Simeon and Levi, like he said. I'm going to read that for you in Genesis 49. Turn there briefly. I'm almost done. I'm not going to keep you too long. Jimmy, uh, the Bible says, I'm sorry, chapter 49, Genesis. Verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brethren, instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. My honor, be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. We see that Moses got angry with the people of God. He couldn't take no more. Because somebody said, be careful when you say, I can't take no more. <laughs> he kept murmuring and complaining every step of the way he couldn't do enough for him and then God said okay Moses smite the rock and I'm going to give water they said we ain't got no water here. he brought us out there everything was he brought us out into this wilderness to kill us but, um, but finally he, when God told him to smite the rock that anger came out. Wow, wow, you rebels! You know? <laughs> God says, just for this, you ain't going over. Look at somebody say, help, Lord! <laughs> Thank God Jesus he ain't quite doing this like this, isn't that right? <laughs> but I'm just pointing out that Moses got angry with Israel and he didn't, he was not able to make it in the promised land. But the good news is this. The Bible has, Joel talks about it, Hosea, Psalms, Nehemiah talks about that God is gracious and merciful 
and slow to anger. I'm so glad. Even if he got angry, his anger is not like us. But I'm just saying, he's slow to anger. And then the Proverbs and Psalms and Proverbs has a lot to say about it. Psalms 37 says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Proverbs 14 says, he that is soon angry deals foolishly. Let me pause there. The anger within a person will make them do unwise things or have make unwise decisions, right? So it's important that we allow the Lord to visit us. There's no sin for him to visit us. It's a delight. And then Psalm, Proverbs 15 says, Grievous words stir up anger. Proverbs 15, 18 says, He that is slow to anger appeases strife. If somebody is arguing and fussing and carrying on, and you know, if you... you uh, if you're quick-tempered, it can be tit for tat, right? Before you know it, you're in war. But if you're slow to anger, I always use my parents for it, and I have to be careful, but I, I love to think about it. He that is slow to anger, right? Appeases strife. You ever seen somebody argue about himself? That's why they get tired, won't they? They just go fussing, 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 and fussing. Just <laughs> somebody laughing. Let them keep fussing, but don't you say nothing, isn't that right? Because if you say something, you're going to stir it up. You put, it's like putting some kerosene on fire. Isn't that right? <laughs> so don't say nothing. They'll get tired out why, isn't that right? He that is slow to anger, peace is strife. Slow to anger. The person that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Oh my God, that's powerful. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Proverbs 27 says, anger is outrageous. And wrath is cruel. Ecclesiastes 7 says, don't be quick to be angry. Don't be quick to be angry. Ephesians 4 31 said, let all bitterness and anger be put away. Isn't that right? Proverbs 21 talks about dwelling in the, uh, in, with a contentious woman. Don't throw anything. I'm about to say something about the man, okay? <laughs> Proverbs 22 says, don't be friends with an angry man. Isn't that right? My God, hallelujah. Angry man will stir up strife. He's always causing trouble. Isn't that right? Person that's angry and got anger in their spirit, everywhere they go, it's like strife, man. Everywhere they go because there's anger in their spirit that they're satisfied. But look at somebody said, thanks be to God for our Lord Jesus Christ. He came to help us. I thank God for that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Thank you very much. And then the Bible says, Matthew 5, Whoever is angry with his brother without a cause, you know the rest of it. Prodigal's son, was his eldest brother, was angry. And he had that anger. He was serving and he had that anger. And it was just brought out when his father did this for his brother. But he was angry all along. And then when his father, when his father uh, brought his son back home and began to bless him, then he was and he said, what's going on, y'all? And his servant said, well, your brother's come back home, man. Your father threw a party, man. He was so mad, wouldn't go in. Father got wind of it. He came out there and asked him, son, what's going on? And then he let it spill out. You know what he said? He said, how, how do you know he was angry? Because he said, all these years. You know, when I first read that a few years ago, I was like, mm, that sounds like me, you know. <laughs> we have to be honest with ourselves. Isn't that right? And it came out all these years I've served you. 
all these years I've served you, did everything right. And you wouldn't even give me nothing to celebrate with my friends. Not even a little goat, a little kid. But what am I saying? I'm saying that anger is something that we have to deal with because it impairs, it hinders us from prosperity like God wants us. Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry and sin not. Saying that there's a tendency when we get angry to do things that we wouldn't do otherwise. Isn't that right? Yeah. And so he said a bishop must not be soon angry. God has a lot to say about it. You know, we're talking about the destructive uh, the kind of anger that can be detrimental to our health. And so we're focusing in on the children, not the fathers, because the fathers may be dead and gone, some of them, but the children, the product of the fathers. What about you today? You says, I'm a believer. I'm not angry. But did you know believers can be angry too? Believers can be angry too. And many times believers, if they're not careful, can take that anger to the grave. But it's not God's will. He always wants to help us. He's such a good God. Remember this in conclusion. God can help us. He can heal the heart. All he needs is our go ahead. God, do what you need to do. And if we give him that go ahead, God will work. He's so faithful to do it. And boy, will we feel better. Boy, will we feel so much better. Cleanliness will come. The cleanness of God will come upon us. We, we breathe like freshness of air. And we, we, we begin to see things look different to us when, 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 when we've allowed God to cleanse us. And, and people look different, you know. We, we look at others differently now because of, 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 of what God does through us. He cleanses our heart. And he sanctifies us by his spirit and his love and it makes us want to love people more it takes God to do that isn't that right God does that he bore, he bore us like on eagle's wings he's so gracious and I hope I can make it appealing to God's people enough to say God I want what you have for me it is so good but if anger sets in if it's not dealt with a person goes slowly downhill first it can be anger or resentment and it turns into others that start to affect in our speech so it then it start to affect in our relationship with others next thing you know our friends get few isn't that right and it can affect our family sometimes and our spouses and our children get upset with us and we're still standing our ground they don't see what I'm going through they don't understand me but maybe it I don't want to go like this. But maybe it's not so much that they understand us as that we understand. Isn't that right? Seeking to understand is so important. You never know what a person is going through. Sometimes people can be going through some painful, painful things. And they don't have the answers. They're terrified. They're afraid. They don't know the outcome. They don't know what's going to happen to them. And so their anxieties may be saying, I'm afraid. I don't know what's going on. But you may have a word from the Lord that you can, you've discerned them. You've discerned where they are. And, and God has given you that spiritual insight so that you can begin to see beyond their actions and see beyond what they're saying and see the condition of their hearts and see the cry of their soul and begin to speak right 
there for the word that they need. And that word is a timely word. And that word would go all the way down in the deep part of their soul and bring the kind of peace that God is looking for us. But we are restorers. Isn't that right? And we were repairers of the breach and restorers of past to dwell in. Well, God put in us that spirit of restoration. He put it in you and I. So no matter what people are going through, let's begin to pray for insight. Let's begin to pray, God, give me insight so I can see beyond that person's action. So I can see, Lord God, um, and what they need. Because after all, you look and you see my, you don't look at my fault. You look way beyond my fault. And you see my needed soul. And you cry unto, you come to me and you heal my soul. And you speak kindness to me. You speak encouragement to me. You build me where I'm torn down because you understand my need. He looked beyond our faults. But if we have anger deep inside, we can't see it that way because that anger will come up like a flag and won't allow us to. But I've got some good news for you. This is the day the Lord has made. And we can rejoice in him because God has already planned and purposed that at this appointed time that he's going to heal angry heart. He's going to heal the children that have been angry so long with their fathers. There's restoration for you now. Somebody can take courage and be glad for God says there's restoration for you. This is a new day. It's a day of hope. It's a day of life. It's a day where God the Son is coming to breathe life upon you and I. A new and a fresh. Somebody, it is your time. It is your season. You can rejoice now. Oh, God is going to remove, remove the cobwebs from the mind. And God is going to do things that you've longed for for so long because you've cried along. And God says, but it's the appointed time. I had to wait for the appointed time. I do nothing before the time comes. But now that it's the time, you can stretch out and begin and say, God, this is my season. This is the time where you've appointed for me to be blessed upon the face of the earth. Lift your hands now. Lift your head that's been bow down and begin to look to God again. Um, hallelujah. The Bible says he look, they looked to him and they were lightened. It is the time now. Be not discouraged. Um, do like Samson. Shake yourself. Hallelujah. It is not a time to be discouraged but it's a time now. Hallelujah. To latch a hold the horns of the altar and begin to see God for who he really is. Isn't that right, somebody? Hallelujah. God wants to pour joy into our souls. Joy unspeakable. Joy for the weary hearts. God, we thank you now. And we give you praise and, and we give you glory and we give you honor. For us in Jesus' name, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you. For you are gracious and kind. You are plenty in mercy. And we honor you now for being so good to us, Lord. Thank you. I want you to stand with me now. Hallelujah, Father. We praise you and we honor you because of what you've done. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit, Lord, that does these wonderful things to and for us. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Master. Thank you for your kindness. Oh, yes. Uh, send the anointing again. Send the refreshing of your spirit again. Oh, I praise you, Father. And I bless you now. For you've been so good. You've been glorious in your kindness. Somebody... It's a time 